in pursuit of health and wisdom. Sapio with Buck Joffrey. Welcome back to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. I'm Buck Joffrey, obviously. And today my guest is Dr. Kenneth Frumpkin. Dr. Frumpkin recently retired uh, from a 36-year medical career and facing his own age memory-related challenges. Uh, he has an upcoming book, Aging or Alzheimer, which explains what is currently known about the challenges to memory and cognition that come with longevity. He also provides an empathetic and comprehensive guide to answering those questions. Dr. Frumpkin, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. I should point out you've had a couple other books here, Aging or Alzheimer, A Doctor's Personal Guide to Memory Loss, Cognitive Decline and Dementia. The website is agingoralzheimers.com. So why don't we start with this? So, Dr. Uh, Frumpkin, what's your um, so your background? It's interesting. You, I, I mean, you didn't start out uh, in the field of uh, of neurology or Alzheimer's. So, how did uh, how did you end up getting so interested in this topic? I started getting interested in it when I started worrying about my own memory. Yeah. Uh, about the time I was thinking of retiring, I began to notice some subtle changes and had managed to. Uh, convinced myself that it was a good time, a good idea uh, to back off from the practice of emergency medicine. Sure. And like every other time I was faced with a, a kind of an academic question, I, I started researching it. So as soon as I had the time, I began to read everything I could about the, about the subject. And I eventually convinced myself that, that I was potentially suffering from aphasia. And so, like any good doctor, I found the aphasia guy who happened to be like 900 miles away. Yeah. And he pronounced me normal for age, which I thought, which reassured me for about the return flight. <laughs> uh, and then I began to read some more on the subject. And as I went into the, the literature, I discovered that like so much of the other complicated medical literature where they're producing four or five hundred articles uh, a month. The scientific and medical communities wait for those wonderful reviews that we all use when we're trying to uh, study a subject. And those reviews come out about every 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, a program at the National Institutes of Health that sort of fosters that. And uh, all of the reviews that come out in like 2014, 2015 to 2019, and this was 20, 2017, 2018. And so it became, as I began to read, I began to see gaps in those reviews that I had to fill in for myself by looking at the current literature. Sure. And as I did that, I became aware of some items that weren't included in, in, in the previous reviews, more uh, that applied to me. Uh, one of them being uh, subjective cognitive decline, which is uh, a chapter in my book that was previously not mentioned uh, before 2019 or so. When you went down this journey, I guess one of the questions I think anybody in your position has is, well, gosh, is this normal? And I hate to use the word normal because there's such yeah. variability in this, but uh, is, this, is, is this normal mental cognition declines in the same way that maybe somebody can't run the way they used to when they were younger? Or is this something that I should be worried about that I'm in, uh, in an early Alzheimer's or early dementia type of, of situation? Uh, I'm sure that came to mind. And, and maybe you can tell us kind of what you um, uh, what path you went down to try to understand that. Sure. Well, normal, as you mentioned, is a is a is a difficult concept and, and a statistical one. So I went down the usual the usual path. I, I uh, had uh, neurocognitive testing, which came back uh, normal, and normal was defined as my score was within the range of the average score of people my age, gender, and uh, level of education. Uh, and a sort of ethnic background, that giant pile of normal people. And that I found that reassuring. Uh, but then when I started to read about previously undescribed issues like subjective cognitive decline, 
I realized that there was no great test for any of that stuff, that the presence of normal uh, neurocognitive testing, the, the one that takes a half a day or the one that your doctor uses in the office to have you draw a clock or, or, or answer some questions, both of those tests are, are, are uh, not sensitive for this, the early, for my diagnosis, which is the earliest uh, symptomatic stage. Uh, that can precede uh, dementia. Were there any uh, blood tests or anything that you were thinking about taking, perhaps for amyloid or those types of things that were out? Oh, I read all about that stuff. And and it's, again, it's in the book, but my personal decision was no. And I don't necessarily, and that's drawn on, on reading. I've got almost 350 references in that book. And the amyloid, you know, the, the blood testing, uh, especially at the time I was doing the research, seemed to me um, just a, a way to, to depress me for the rest of my life because sure. um, there was no, there still is, frankly, no treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, to label myself uh, with that without the prospect of doing anything about it was a decision I made not to do. For our audience, maybe you can talk a little bit about the different types of memory and perhaps some of the things that you were experiencing in particular. For the audience, again, the, the sort of, I mean, when every, you, know, you will know and I definitely know that, that everything gets worse when you, when you yeah. get older. Yeah. Uh, statistically, about 40% of people over 65 uh, develop memory difficulties right along with uh, their Medicare card. The reason for that is the same as, as why everything else starts falling apart, is that specific regions in the brain that are involved in the formation or retrieval of memories begin to break down. Proteins required to grow and repair aging cells uh, disappear. The same reason your skin isn't what one skin isn't what it used to be. Changes in memory with age are both subjective, which was my problem, and objective on standardized memory tests, which was not my problem. But they revolve around the vagueness or difficulty with attention, just kind of making mistakes, finding specific names and words, uh, remembering the source of information and the level of detail, and uh, remembering to perform an intended action in the future. You know, take your medicines, wondering why you ended up in the closet. You know, all people my age end up with similar events. The, right. the, 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 the same thing goes with learning, uh, with cognition. That's memory. Uh, the problems with cognition, uh, the sort of flip side of memory, uh, usually start around a, after age 60. In language, uh, speech, pr- speech production drops off uh, compared with when you compare People my age with young adults, uh, we are less verbose, more repetitive, and less specific in our spontaneous speech. Uh, we can attend to fewer tasks at the same time. And again, this is in the range of normal. That is, compare the individual who has symptoms with the va- with a, a giant mean created by uh, individuals of the same age and characteristics. So uh, attention on complex tasks, you know, if you want to think walk and chew gum, uh, that gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, remembering learned material uh, and multitasking gets harder and spatial orientation, some of those things uh, get worse. And the, the good news is that some things are stable with normal aging. Uh, vocabulary, historical memories for public events. Everybody remembers where they were when, well, we'll now remember where they were when President, uh, former President Trump was uh, shot. Uh, yeah. And uh, procedural memories remain constant, like playing the piano, riding a bicycle. So if you see an old guy riding a bicycle, he may still not know where he's going. <laughs> uh, and uh, simple tasks like repeating digits, those sorts of things. So. So the question becomes, how, do, how did I decide and how does one decide that you've got dementia? I don't have dementia, but I have a, a condition that, that in, a, in 25% of cases uh, may end up leading to dementia. And the, the simple answer, and the one I find that people don't quite understand, is, is dementia is a simple equation. It is memory loss plus cognitive loss 
the uh, language problem solving, that's cognition, plus interference with daily activities. And it's the interference with daily activities that becomes obvious to, to yourself uh, and to others and which defines dementia. Before that, you've got these cognitive problems and memory problems which may or may not be detected by tests, depending on how the, de the degree is. In your research, did you determine or find anything that you thought was actually useful as a potential preventative measure or to slow things down? That's a very good question. And, and uh, the answers are, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what the literature says. And there are, and I think that you actually, I, I, I enjoyed your, uh, your, your book on, on aging, uh, or on, uh, and, uh, and I think you have the, you have the right idea. And prevention occurs uh, with number one, uh, avoiding risk factors. Potentially, there's a list of potentially modifiable sure. uh, risk factors that covers almost four pages uh, in the book. Well, there are definitely those types of things, it seems, um, just from uh, preventative things for overall health. For example, people don't think of avoiding, you know, atherosclerotic disease as, as something that would necessarily also help with future cognitive issues. But absolutely, um, those are the types of things that uh, people don't think about. I'm wondering, um, have you had a chance to... Let me, let me finish that. May I finish that? that other yeah, part? of course, I, I of course. What I was looking for. The potentially modifiable risk factors that have been identified for, and we're talking about Alzheimer's dementia right now, are lifestyle, which you've talked about, physical inactivity, smoking, obesity, excessive alcohol, all those things we should be doing anyway uh, to live longer. Uh, uh, based on your interests. And then the, there are medical conditions with increased dementia risk. So you take sure. people without them and the people with them and the people without them have a, a, a lower incidence of dementia. So hypertension, diabetes, depression, traumatic brain injury, uh, hearing impairment, vision impairment, cholesterol problems, all of these things, yeah. that if you can avoid them, uh, will help you live longer. Uh, and in living longer, your chances of, of dementia uh, go down. Co as opposed to going up with living right. COVID-19 is, is a new one, and you want to try to avoid oh, that's that. That's interesting. That's, you know, everybody says, what are you worried about? Everybody's fine, but, you know, I don't want any more brain fog. Yeah. I've had my, I've had my share. Uh, and there, there's actually uh, uh, some social and environmental factors that you can hopefully avoid, like... Uh, a, a, or or master like education social isolation air pollution noise and uh trying to stay away from widowhood which is uh, yeah a little hard these days yeah yeah certainly there are genetic aspects of it as you kind of revealed too oh yeah you know with the uh, apoe4 alleles and things like that but there's not a whole lot right now necessarily that, um, I mean, apart from all of the, ex, uh, you know, uh, lifestyle things that we talked about for that. I'm curious, have you looked into, you know, I've, I have just begun to sort of scratch the surface on some of the work that Dean Ornish is doing um, at UCSF um, with regard to the Ornish diets and, and things like that that uh, seem to be fairly uh, impressive in terms of results. Well, there's a, there's again, there's a section in the book that that talks about the language of unverified hope. I, that's not I'm paraphrasing. Sure. Uh, and there's so much stuff out there. It's really out there every day in our news feeds. So what I try to caution people to do is take with a grain of salt any statement that has in it the word may. Yeah. Or could. Yeah. Or associated with because. The science of epidemiology it can associate genital and, uh, you know, female genital infections are associated with being female. Okay. Sure, sure. And so diet is important. Uh, and there's a few studies on diet, a few decent sized studies on diet that recommend the standard Medi the Mediterranean diet as a preventative, something you can do to, to uh, lower your likelihood of developing dementia. So I try to stay away from recommending 
one person's latest brilliant idea. Sure. What I say to people, friends and family is that if you're comfortable that it's not harmful and it makes you feel better, go ahead. No one's, no one's going to know until Ornish does his studies uh, over time uh, whether or not it helps or not. But if it's intrinsically harmless, go for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How about some of the newer drugs? Have you looked into those in terms of, are you hopeful at all about some of the findings that you're, you know, that are being reported? It's nice to see some progress that the, the literature, there was no new drug. Uh, again, I'm, I have, I confess to some problems with memory, but there's, there's been no new drug for Alzheimer's from 2013 maybe yeah to 2021 i mean it's, and not that they weren't trying you know because this is a we or a, i am a very large market the new drugs fall into the category of they may be helpful someday but i have i've been offered not my i've been offered family members of mine have been offered uh denanomab i think everyone should make their own decision but uh the first drug out that everybody got all excited about was suddenly off the market in, in under six months. Sure. Uh, there's plenty more work to be done. I have a, a neurologist whom I trust who, who agrees that the only benefit so far with any of these drugs, including the latest and greatest, are, an ex are a delay in the onset or progression of Alzheimer's disease. There's still no cures. And if you read the dissenting articles in the literature, there's a number of people who think that, uh, well, it, we're really not concentrating enough on the other protein, the tau protein. Uh, and that's really where the problem is because uh, they feed off each other in some fashion. And I'm no biochemist, but so no, I'm not. I am well aware of those drugs. I've I've read what is available on them. I have talked to my uh, excellent uh, neurologist about it, and I'm myself not interested. But I wouldn't. There, you know, that's one of those things where people people's personal preferences and lifestyle choices uh, are uh, uh, differ widely, and if someone wants to try it and they have a doctor who they trust who will help them through it i i don't see anything wrong with that i generally envision those people as generous to the following generations i i, I say in the book that um, if you're going to volunteer for an experimental drug or or a, a brand new drug uh, think of it more as a donation to pre uh, subsequent generations than it is to your own than potentially to your own health if you could leave uh, one last, uh, I guess, um, words of wisdom for anybody who's starting to feel like they're getting older and having some new onset cognitive aging, what do you tell them as a physician even? Well, as a, as a physician, I tell them to go, to go and talk to their doctor, which is what we all say when someone asks us a, mm -hmm. a difficult question. And I, I add, I tell them to take someone with them who knows them well because this right. is a difficult problem to describe if you're experiencing it and much better to describe if you're closely observing it and I, right. the, the line i use in the book is is uh going to a doctor by yourself to talk about your memory is like bringing your high school yearbook to a job interview <laughs> it's funny well, okay. Um, well, I do appreciate your time. Again, the book, uh, Dr. Frumpkin, is Aging or Alzheimer's, A Doctor's Personal Guide to Memory Loss, Cognitive Decline, and Dementia. And the uh, website is agingoralzheimers.com. I appreciate you being on and sharing your story with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been, uh, you know, you, you were, I was hoping you would be gentle. I've never been on a podcast before. <laughs> Well, hopefully it was gentle. So, I agree. Okay. Love to have you back again. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. A quick reminder that while I am, in fact, a surgeon, 
Nothing I say should be construed as medical advice. Now make sure to include your physician in any medical decisions you make. And also, if you're enjoying the show, please make sure to show your support with a like, share, or subscribe. Until next time, this is Buck Joffrey for Sapio with Buck Joffrey.